the daring dam busters raid in the night of the 16th to the 17th of May 1943 is among the most memorable events of World War II. Already well before the war in 1937, the British Air Ministry had contemplated about what could be strategic targets in Germany. The dams in the Ruhr Valley were high on their list, but at the same time they were also considered as complicated targets. Simply bombing the huge concrete dam structures was deemed impossible. Inspired by playing with skimming stones as a child, Assistant Chief Designer at Vickers, Barnes Wallace, came up with the idea to develop a skimming or rather a bouncing bomb. He had worked for that company on both the Vickers Wellesley and the Vickers Wellington bombers. His idea was to drop a heavy bomb from an aircraft and let it bounce towards the dam in order to bring it right up close to the dam wall, let it sink and then detonate at the dam's weak spots at the base below the water surface. This would also bypass the underwater anti-torpedo nets that the Germans had placed to protect their dams. He started to experiment in his back garden by shooting glass marbles across a tub filled with water in order to calculate what velocity and angle would be needed to make a heavy bomb bounce. The famous 1956 Dam Buster movie excellently depicts the experiments he conducted and the bureaucratic red tape that he needed to overcome to get support by the military top for his idea. After conducting very small-scale experiments in a huge water basin at the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington and on outdoor scale models, he got permission to conduct full-scale experiments with the use of a Wellington bomber. These trials were conducted at Chessel Beach in Dorset. Initially, the experiments were carried out with drum-shaped mock-up bombs with a wooden outer casing. Until many years after the war, it was kept secret that the drum was given a backspin to make it bounce as desired. An Avro Lancaster bomber was equipped with a special spinning construction to make the bomb spin just before being released. With every test, the wooden casing would not hold up to the forces when it hit the water surface and thus the bomb would disintegrate. Wallace realized that he didn't need the wooden casing and thus continued testing without. After many experiments, Barnes Wallace got it right. He managed to let the bomb bounce 20 times over a distance of nearly 400 meters and concluded that the aircraft would have to fly at a dangerously low level of only 80 meters and needed to release the bomb at a highly precise distance from the dams at a speed of precisely 232 miles per hour. A film made of the Chessel Beach trials convinced the Air Ministry to go ahead with the Dambusters project. A catapult-alike device was constructed to visually determine the distance to the dam. Also, the approach to the dams could not be a straight line, but due to hilly terrain and anti-aircraft flak, the pilots needed to train for complicated approach maneuvers. A special RAF squadron was formed for the so-called Operation Chastise, the famous 617 squadron, as part of No. 5 Group RAF. Clearly, the operation's name indicated the intent to give the German war industry a huge flogging. The squadron was led by Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Thirteen Australians also formed part of the crew. Eventually it was decided to deploy Avro Lancaster Mark III Type 464 bombers for the operation, the most powerful bomber of the RAF, capable of delivering the 3,400 kg heavy bouncing bombs. The crews practiced at Ibrook Reservoir near Uppingham, Rutland, Aberton Reservoir near Colchester, Derwent Reservoir in the Derbyshire Peak District and, as already mentioned, Fleet Lagoon on Chessel Beach. 
On the night of the 16th of May 1943, two Lancaster formations, respectively consisting of nine and five bombers, took off from RAF Scampton. Their selected targets were the Mona Dam and the Sorper Dam, upstream from the Ruhr Industrial Area, and the Ada Dam on the Ada River more east. Third mobile reserve formation of five aircraft took off two hours later, either to also bomb the main dams or to attack three small secondary target dams. Their aim was to shut down the hydropower stations that provided the German war industry in the Ruhr area with electric power. A code named Nigger was determined that would be reported over the radio if a dam had been effectively hit. Nigger, not Digger, was the name of Guy Gibson's 617 Squadron mascot, a black Labrador dog. Sadly Nigger was killed after being hit by a car on the morning of the raid. Gibson kept this event secret in order not to jinx the operation. As regards the outcome of Operation Chastise we can be short. The Ader and the Mona dams were effectively breached. Barnes Wallace's idea had worked. The other attacked dams remained intact despite the Sorper dam being hit three times. RAF 617 Squadron lost 56 aircrew out of a total of 133, with 53 dead and 3 captured, and lost 8 out of 19 aircraft. Here are some rather convincing AI image to video simulations depicting the damage to the Ada and Mona dams after the raid. An estimated 1,650 civilians, about 600 Germans and 1,000 enslaved labourers, mainly Soviet but also Dutch, Ukrainian, French and Belgian POWs, perished. Huge areas of farmland became useless for years to come due to the floods. The survivors of the raid were hailed as heroes in the Allied press. Guy Gibson survived the raid, but was killed after his plane crashed in the Netherlands at Steenbergen in September the following year. The question I am struggling with is did the dam busters really change the course of the war? Although military speaking it was a success and gave the German war industry a blow, fact is that the Germans rapidly repaired both destroyed dams by using forced labour. Both power stations were up and running again by September 1943, so just four months later. These are the crew members of the 19 Lancaster bombers that participated in the raid. Each crew consisted of a pilot, flight engineer, navigator, wireless operator, bomb aimer and front and rear gunner. Each Lancaster had an AJ call sign followed by a letter. 
What also strikes me is that the Ada Dam is very far east from the rural area. How much effect did the destruction of this dam have on the rural area war industries in comparison to the Mona Dam? Far more factories were affected near the Mona Sperre, and the death toll there at 1650 was much higher than only 70 around the Ada Sperre. Inflicting more damage on the Sorper Dam would probably have had a far bigger impact than the Ada Dam destruction. After the operation, Barnes Wallace admitted that he never would have engaged in such a project if he had known that it would cost so many airmen's lives. He also wrote, I feel a blow has been struck at Germany from which she cannot recover several years. I am sorry to say that, although a huge Dam Buster Films fan, on closer inspection, Operation Chastise did not have the military effect that was at the time believed. Soon, full water output was restored thanks to an emergency pumping scheme inaugurated only the previous year, and the electric grid was again producing power at full capacity. The raid was in fact hardly more than an inconvenience to the Ruhr's industrial output. Hitler's architect Albert Speer in his book wrote that he was amazed that the Allies never performed any follow-on attacks while the dams were being repaired. Historians concur that the value of the bombing can perhaps best be seen as a very good boost to British morale. Other projects, to my opinion, had a far greater impact on the outcome of the war, like Operation Overlord, i.e. D-Day, and Alan Turing's Enigma code-breaking work at Bletchley Park. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. See you the next time.